Oh, oh. He's still all about heart. all about the molar, all about molar and representation. There's so much in this paragraph that is going to just be fucking painful uh, to get through, and it's so much, and it's great. That's it. That's all I got. It's great. That's all I'm going to say. It's fucking good. But um, you know what, J.K. and Drew, we're going to just kick it off with you. Uh, we'll get moving. Uh, thank you very much today for joining us as the Delusing Watery Quarantine Collective continues into its ongoing reading of Anti-Oedipus. We're now in a little bit further into uh, 4.5 as we get through the end, the second positive task of schizoanalysis. Uh, wow. Uh, I, I don't even want to try to sum up where we're getting through, but the conversation essentially at this point uh, through this has been slowly really making their way through the molecular all these elements play together how the molecular multiplicity and the molar interplay are they two different things no they are not they're not even two sides of a coin they're two orders of the same thing they're two uh, regimes of the same totality but what does it mean how do these things play together how does all of it really work uh it's important for us to spend a great deal of time getting through because the second positive task kind of lives in this space and our understanding of it, especially as we talk about generalized representations or the things that we believe that we believe and why and what they mean. That's uh, uh, my very short semi-intro to as we make it through more of AO. Uh, any other notes or anything before I start reading? I'm going to show the uh, text. So that way, if you don't have it, you're more than happy to. The little thing, you just click on that little thing, you stream it, you can, just, you can see it. I got it highlighted and everything for you. I'm actually going to delete the highlight though, but yeah. Um, we'll make you, our way you through. Can't, you can't give the highlight and take the highlight away, man. I, I, I did because I just highlighted super fast so that way I'd be able to mark where we were this week. And it was an irrelevant highlight because it was most of the paragraph. Um, let's make our way through it. Let's do it. <sighs> you. Before you go, can you read the grace note into that? The order is not, just so we got the context. Oh, yes. uh, I'm actually going to go slightly behind that. So, uh, cool. In other terms, forms of gregariousness are never indifferent. They refer back to the qualified forms that produce them by creative selection. The order is not gregariousness to selection, but on the contrary, molecular multiplicity forms of selection performing the selection molar or gregarious aggregates that result from this selection what are these qualified forms formations of sovereignty as nietzsche said that play the role of totalizing unifying signifying objectities that assign organizations lacks and goals the full bodies determine the different modes of the socius, veritable heavy aggregates of the earth, the despot and capital, full bodies or clothed substances, which are distinguished from the full body without organs or the naked matter of molecular desiring production. If we wonder where these forms or force come from, it is evident that they are not to be explained in terms of any goal or end, since they are what determines goals and ends. The form or quality of a given socius, the body of the earth, the body of the despot, the body of capital money, depends on a state or degree of intensive development of the productive forces, insofar as these forces define a man nature independent of all the social formations, or rather, common to them all, what the Marxists term the givens of useful labor. The form or quality of the socius is therefore itself produced, but as the unengendered, that is, as the neutral or divine precondition of production corresponding to a given degree to which it affixes a structural unity and apparent goals, to which it falls back, and whose forces it appropriates, thereby determining the selections, the accumulations, and the attractions without which these forces would not assume a social character. It is indeed in this sense that social production is desiring production itself under determinate conditions, 
These determinate conditions are thus the forms of gregariousness as a socius or full body under whose effect the molar, the molecular formations constitute molar aggregates. All right. Uh, let's try to make our way through this. The, the ending of the previous paragraph outlined actually what they're discussing here. It's the last bit. It's, it's the order is not gregariousness to selection is not that at large, we have these large representations and those are the elements that select actions, desires, representations, identity, blah, 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 all of that. But instead it's actually the opposite. It is the molecular multiplicity, the desiring machines themselves that also then form, make forms of selection, performing the selection. They, they basically uh, emergently generate uh, the, the form of selection that performs the selection itself. Think of it as they condition selection. Uh, and then ultimately that then uh, selects the molar or gregarious aggregates that result from this selection. It is a production from the smallest bits to the largest, not the largest to some play within the ego. These qualified forms that do this, that play the role of totalizing, unifying, signifying objectities, these elements that assign organizations, lacks, and goals, these representations, they, they are full bodies. These are the full bodies that determine the different modes of the socius, the heavy aggregates of the earth and the despot and capital. They refer here, and they have throughout, full bodies or clothed substances. They're distinguished from the full body without organs or the naked matter of molecular desiring production. This is not them. This is a different thing. These elements are fully generated. They are the full body. They are the entirety of the representation, the, uh, how to phrase, how to phrase this. They are, uh, the form or quality of the socius is therefore itself produced, but as unengendered, a neutral or divine precondition to a given degree which affixes a structural unity and apparent goals to which it falls back and whose forces it appropriates. Um, capitalism falls back on the productive labor of managers, woodworkers, all of these totalized elements, the, the proletariat, the bourgeoisie, claims them for itself, but all of these elements ultimately are produced by the molecular desiring machines, which they themselves, in their process, create the selection that performs the selection, the process itself, which then generates these molar aggregates. Um, the phrasing they have here that is the most clear, but I think I would want to spend the most time on, um, social production, uh, which is the molar, is desiring production itself under determinate conditions. Um, the forms of the socius, the forms of the full body, these things that have taken up uh, sort of residence in the process of it all, are ultimately just desiring production, but under determinate conditions, uh, contingent social conditions, determinate conditions. It's a fucking good paragraph. Um, anything to add, uh, Jack, JK, Drew? Questions, discussion, please. Yeah, I mean, playing off that, I'm reading it in terms of why the molar? How do you get the molar, right? Um, especially since we're talking about the, the, a major distinction being the determinate conditions part, right? Mm -hmm. So how does desiring production become social production? Uh, one thing the previous paragraph I'm kind of attaching to is when, it, this is 342 in my copy, when Nietzsche says that the selection is most often exerted in favor of the large number, he inaugurates a fundamental intuition that will inspire modern thought. For what he means is that the large numbers, the large aggregates, do not exist prior to a selective pressure that might elicit singular lines from them, but that quite on the contrary, these large numbers and aggregates are born of the selective pressure the cr that crushes, eliminates, or regularizes the singularities. So part of the reason I'm attached to that is like, you can kind of read this implicitly with them. There's a famous quote from Marx, right? Um, the dominant ideas of the culture are the, dominant, are the ideas of the dominant class. That's, you know, that's a very famous um, piece from Marx. 
and I think what Deleuze and Guattari are saying here is right, kind of with an eye to that. Well, maybe it's not the class so much as it is a question of how, maybe it's not even just ideas, right? But more a question of if we put that in terms of psychoanalysis, how do the forces cause pressure that give rise to the things that will appear to us as those ideas, as those classes? Right, so it's it's really interesting if you think of it that way, because then the point then becomes right. How does desiring production become social production in this sense? Right, it's basically a, a question of how pressure is created, and that'll be important for the, the you know lines of escape, lines of flight, or we might say the lines of release here. How do you kind of how can things be freed from the aggregation, from the gregarious? Or more directly, how can they be released from the pressure? Very much. Well, and they're also making a secondary play because as we've talked about and gone over, desire doesn't want a thing. It doesn't have goals or aims necessarily. So how do we get to the point where a man says, you know what I really want is a wife and a picket fence and two and a half children. Desire doesn't know what any of those things are. Uh, so is it that at the large scale, we have these representations that ultimately condition us, uh, which would be, I think, the more traditional psychoanalytic view of, uh, you know, the, the symbology signification that we live within ultimately produces and changes our own subjectivity. And that is conditioned by the upper. It's like, well, wait, no, no, that, that would basically put us in a really weird spot where desire wants a thing, but how would desire or libido know what a house is or a picket fence? These things have secondary meaning and that's like very secondary. How do we break even further from that and continue this direction towards a more machinic way of looking at all of it? A, uh, uh, one that, that privileges desire and privileges uh, the the pieces that actually are the fount, the the partial objects and the desire that comes from the 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 actual libidinal energy. Where is this element? And the line in here that I really love is um, full bodies are closed substances which are distinguished from the full body without organs or the naked matter of molecular desiring production. Full bodies or closed substances. This phrasing is talking about kind of a space of representation. It isn't on the one side, the one with a full body without organs, um, which they use in a lot of different ways, but this isn't that. This is also not the naked matter of molecular desiring production. This is not just what desire looks like. It happens to take the shape of a house or something or a happy, successful man or Brooks or whatever I think I am at any given time. Instead, the next line, if we wonder where these forms of force come from, it is evident that they are not to be explained. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's evident that they are not to be explained in terms of any goal or end, since they are what determines goals and ends. The former quality of a given socius, the body of the earth, the despot, the capital, depends on the state or degree of intensive development of the productive forces. In so far as these forces define a man nature independent of all social formations or rather common to them all. We're now starting to get at this thing that is actually, as they say, uh, either uh, creates all of it or is, is independent from social formations or common to all of them, uh, which I kind of like that they allow for either. But it's, what is this base thing? Well, it's not me as a man. It's not even an ego, which is still a representation. That's a whole body in and of itself. So what is forming these? Well, we're talking about these things being elements of force. We're talking about sort of the power and the drive behind them. And suddenly we start are able to start seeing, oh, wait, well, that, that force is produced. The quality of it is produced. But, it, you know, the socius itself is neutral, divine precondition of production corresponding to a degree which it affixes a structural unity and apparent goals to which it falls back and whose force it appropriates, thereby determining selections, the acclamations, blah, blah, blah. This part is where they actually go through the process of the thing. Because if capital, the large-scale socius, is taking credit, what is it taking credit for? Well, just as we've talked about throughout the whole book, you take credit for all of your decisions. Oh, I want pizza. 
you think that you actually sprouted this desire for pizza. It certainly had nothing to do with the billions of desiring machines that are ultimately producing this set of things, as well as ultimately informing the force with which uh, pizza or Pizza Hut or an advertisement you saw is coming to the forefront and the desiring machines are attaching all of this, plus you're hungry, plus all of these like things, all of this ultimately produces the desire for pizza. And so you get pizza, but you say, I want pizza. You, you fall back on it. You ex post facto claim all of it as if it was one moment, but it wasn't. The socius does the same exact thing for, I would say, all representation, all full bodies. Um, the, the, the socius exists in this neutral, as they call it, uh, the unengendered, a divine precondition of production. Um, or well, I mean, I would say it, it stands in that way. Um, uh, it, it pretends it's that. Um, and what it does is it, as they lay out, the capitalism lays out at some level uh, a structural unity and apparent goals to which it claims and whose force it appropriates, those goals it appropriates, thereby determining the selections, accumulations, and attractions, uh, without which these forces would not assume a social character. Uh, the libidinal energy that is pushing into them or is being uh, uh, sublimated in some way and driven into these things of uh, building a car, buying a car, making crypto, playing video games, whatever it may be, these drives and, and things are being pushed and they have forces and all of this, but the social at large is taking credit for that, appropriating those forces. And with that, they determine the selections. This social order does that and it claims it ex post facto. It's really a fascinating sort of um, a reversal of a lot of understandings we've had uh, prior to that and a lot of what psychoanalysis does. I really love this section because this is where we're talking about, to me, the most interesting and very particularly laid out way that we talk about social production itself being produced ultimately from underneath, but, but capital claims it for itself. And by claiming it for itself, it allows you to only have certain desires within that larger uh, selective process that representation can have. So ultimately, Desiring production ends up being placed under determinant conditions. Those conditions are the selection process that the socius places, and this is what social production ultimately is. I think. Yes, I'm going to go with yes. Yes. I hope that made sense. No one's talking, so I'm assuming it did or it didn't. Either way. Um, but it's, because uh, we're about to get into the, the second thesis, uh, because to go back underneath all of this is the question from Reich. And it is an amazing question that people don't even like answering today, which is, uh, why does man desire his own oppression? Why, why is this? Why, why do people desire this? Why does, why does everyone desire this thing? And their, their argument essentially is, well, they don't. That's not how it works. Instead, desire is ultimately a force that is attracted to force, and goals are secondary, and goals themselves are actually a thing that is sort of claimed ex post facto, and all of it is ultimately manipulated by the large-scale social formations that take desire and reform it uh, under determinate conditions inside of representation, basically. It's not, it's not that people are tricked. It's not that we, oh, I got hoodwinked into being a fascist. Um, it's not that. It's that they actually are invested in fascism and that they really, really want it, actually, uh, because it has to do with force and it has to do with intensities. And it has to do with things that make sense on an imminent level with the goals being very much secondary. I was just trying to think through this because I, 
I mean, I do agree, right? We're talking about goals being contingent on the molar as opposed to goals preceding the molar. As I, as I read this, they're trying to answer the question, how does the molar form? And part of how it forms seems to be that there is, on one hand, selection, on the other hand, there's pressure, which seems simple enough, and that seems like just general psychoanalysis, right? Mm -hmm. um, as I read it then, it looks like what they're trying to get at then is See, it's, I, I have to think this is where the co-conditioning comes in because it comes off like molar aggregation is formed hand in hand with the socius because where they say, and I think this is a really fascinating point, um, if I can find it, they basically say that what the the, the the modularities of the socius are dependent on these formations. Say, say that one more time for me. They basically say that the what the socius is doing is uh, dependent on the formations. Yes. Do you, know the, um, do you know the sentence I'm looking for? No, but it look, one of the things that we know is there's a general operant similarity between the um the the socius uh and the general BWO. There is a Found oddness. It. Oh, go for it. The full bodies determine the different modes of the socius. Veritable hip of course was the set, second sentence. Veritable heavy aggregates of the earth that just spin the capital. So like Part of what I think they're saying there then is part of what happens in the molar is unity is imparted, right? That uh, it sounds like totality is imparted. It sounds like aggregation is imparted, right? Stats is possible. Uh, and in doing that, you don't get a monolithic molar, despite the totality. You get different modulations of the socius in relation to these different um, basically molar assemblages, right? Different, different gregarity, gregarities? Gregarities. Gregarities? Did we just make a new word? No, no, that's a real word. Is it really? Oh, no, there goes my, there goes my book deal. But I think that's what they're getting at then is like, the molar is formed by the pressure and selection process that imparts this kind of unity, right? Because this is this is basically how does the first synthesis and the second synthesis work at the molar level. Yeah, I think it's because the phrasing they use there again, and you'll see this over the next few paragraphs, and it's been less through the whole book, although they do use it a bit. The phrasing in that sentence specifically, um, veritable heavy aggregates of the earth that's it's not like an accidental word and they don't mean like uh, it's heavy bro but more again to play into force into intensity into this the way that desire and these elements whether it's the aggregate or anything else has a has a power behind it an investment and that development of force, that thing is the primary thing, ultimately. Uh, I mean, after the fact, we rationalize everything. Like, that's how it works. We rationalize why we did X, Y, or Z by sort of generating the meaning and telling the story we want. We're very good at it. Um, uh, we've learned it over many years of practice. But we say, oh, I wanted pizza, or... Um, I, oh, I, I, I knocked over the tower of bricks that my sister was playing with because I felt it was unfair that she was the only person who was able to play with bricks. Um, are you sure you didn't knock it over because it just kind of felt good? <laughs> like, and it was cool to knock it over? Uh, maybe, but that's not how the, we tell the story. And rationalizations and goals, they're after the fact. That's the big push here. Um, to just say again, um, 
Uh, the former quality of the socius is therefore itself produced, but as the unengendered, the natural or divine precondition of production, corresponding to a given degree to which it affixes a structural unity and apparent goals, to which it falls back on and whose forces it appropriates, therefore determining the selections, accumulations, and attractions which out which these forces would not assume a social character. Uh, there is no zero force social reality, zero intensity social reality. It, um, they often have referred to the full body without organs as the zero intensity, the catatonic. Um, intensities are the social. They are the outward force our body makes, our movement makes, muscles and libidinal and all of that. If you want to say like our force and intensity are social and they are sort of that, that odd thing that's happening there. And so ultimately that is desiring production, but under determinate conditions. And these determinate conditions are thus the forms of gregariousness as a socius or full body under whose effect molecular formations constitute molar aggregates. I want to continue now to the next paragraph because it's a little long, but this is the whole point of what we're getting at, and they say it pretty cleanly. Now, we can present the second thesis of schizoanalysis. Within the social investments, we will distinguish the unconscious libidinal investment of group or desire and the preconscious investment of class or interest. The latter passes by way of the large social goals and concerns the organism and the collective organs, including the arranged vacuoles of lack. A class is defined by a regime of syntheses, a state of global connections, exclusive disjunctions, and residual conjunctions that characterize the aggregate being considered. Membership in a class refers to the role in production or anti-production to the place in the inscription to the portion that is due the subjects. The pre-conscious class interest itself thus refers to the selection of flows, to the detachment of clothes, to the subjective remains or revenues. <coughs> and from this viewpoint, it is indeed true that an aggregate comprises practically only a single class, that class which has an interest in a given regime. The other class can constitute itself only by a counter-investment that creates its own interest in terms of new social aims, new organs and means, a new possible state of social syntheses. Whence the necessity for the other class is to be represented by a party apparatus that assigns these aims and means and affects a revolutionary break in the preconscious domain, the, the Leninist break, for example. In this domain of preconscious investments of class or interest, it is therefore easy to distinguish what is reactionary or reformist or what is revolutionary. But those who have an interest in this sense are always of a smaller number than those whose interest in some fashion is had or represented. The class from the standpoint of praxis is infinitely less numerous or less extensive than the class taken in its theoretical determination. Whence the subsisting contradictions within the dominant class, i.e. the class pure and simple. This is obvious in the capitalist regime where, for example, primitive accumulation can take place only for the benefit of a restricted fraction of the whole of the dominant class. But it is just as obvious for the Russian Revolution, where its formation, with its formation of a party apparatus. To state the footnote from Maurice Dobbs' Studies in the Development of Capitalism, there are reasons why the full flowering of industrial capitalism demands not only a transfer of titles to wealth into the hands of the bourgeois, but a concentration of the ownership of wealth into much fewer hands. There is a lot here. Um, and there's a lot here that is um, um, directly against, I would say, prevailing dogma within leftism. Um, their statement about how class works. For example, maybe a bit of a different setup, um, but I think we should probably go through that overall. 
Does anyone want to start with thoughts or a place to focus on a question? Uh, also, welcome, Lily. It's good to have you. Uh, any questions, any thoughts, any random stuff? If you want to, you can type in the chat if you don't want to chat. Otherwise, I'll uh, leave it open for a moment. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, I, I really thought that I understood exactly what this was saying as soon as they read. Uh, you read the, uh, the second thesis, and then I think um, I'm struggling to get past my lifetime of training in capitalism to actually accept the rest, because I think I got it instinctively, and now I'm, like, struggling. Instinctively is good. Instinctively is good. Um, that's, I mean, it's really what it's kind of about a bit and not necessarily sitting in the place of, well, can we put a representation on it? Um, which makes it more difficult. But that's what they're trying to do is utilize representation to describe it. So let's try to make it through. The, the second thesis of schizoanalysis is, um, you know, I'm actually going to read, I'm going to read from Holland. Uh, and I'm going to just read a paragraph from Holland because I think it helps a lot um, with this whole thing. <clears throat> the second thesis of schizoanalysis thus helps explain Deleuze and Guattari's answer to Reich's question regarding fascism. The masses were not tricked. They desired fascism, and fascism wouldn't have succeeded for a moment without that desire, without a libidinal investment. But such investment is not for Deleuze and Guattari a matter of ideology, of interests misunderstood or led astray. It is rather a matter of desire, and how and where desire could invest a greater degree of force and power, even from a distance, or indeed against one's interests. Quote, the most disadvantaged, the most excluded members of society invest with passion the system that oppresses them, and they always find an interest in it, since it is there that they search for and measure it. Fuck, that's a goddamn good line. That's from later in the book. One can posit revolution as the objective interest of the masses or the working class and be perfectly correct. But the real question, the one that schizoanalysis raises with such acuity and tenacity, is under what circumstances that interest corresponds to or becomes their desire, and conversely, how that desire can so easily get captured and taken in quite the opposite direction. S to state, as they're talking about here, it's a difference between desire and interest. They call it, uh, on one side, the unconscious libidinal investment of group or desire. That's the unconscious, unconscious. And the pre-conscious investment of class or interest. Pre-conscious is an interesting thing. Um, because when we talk about pre-conscious versus unconscious, we are not talking about the same fucking thing at all. Uh, so let's pull back on that just slightly. Uh, the unconscious is what we've been talking about. Uh, the machinic desiring machines, uh, the machinic unconscious that is constantly producing. The pre-conscious investments, um, uh, I'm going to say a thing that may be more declarative. I think it's in the correct direction. It is not completely correct. Please continue to read Deleuze and don't just listen to me. I don't know that much. Um, when, you're, when you fall back on your desires and you make a declaration of what your goal is or what you're using for a thing or why, that is interest. And it happens pre-consciously. You're not sitting around going, excellent, which of my desires can I co-op today? That would be conscience. That's not... We don't play in that space. Just before you get to make the claim and the rationalization, it's already made. It's made by these interests. It's made as a pre-conscious investment of class or interest. And this happens after desire has already been sort of invested. This switch and this play is where we talk about desire and interest not necessarily coinciding, but coexisting. Um, I'm going to continue reading a little bit from Holland because this, he's, he has a couple paragraphs on this that I found just incredibly enlightening. Um, not only do objective and subjective interests often diverge, but more significantly for schizoanalysis, unconscious desire and preconscious interest may not coincide. Preconscious investments may be revolutionary in content or objective, yet molar and repressive in form. 
to quote from AO, a group may be revolutionary from the standpoint of class interest and its pre-conscious investments, but not be so, and even remain fascist and police-like from the standpoint of its libidinal investments. To continue Holland, Deleuze and Guattari thus distinguish not only between the two moments or levels of investment, unconscious and pre-conscious, but also between two corresponding kinds of revolutionary break or rupture. A pre-conscious revolutionary break operates in the service of and with a view towards a new socius with new aims and interests, new forms of codifications, axiomization, and new forms of power. An unconscious revolutionary break, by contrast, operates in the promotion of molecular desire, subordinating molar forms to the subversive free play of desiring production. For revolution to occur, the two kinds of breaks must coincide. No revolution is conceivable without a definition of aims and mobilization of interests, but no revolution ever takes place without the investment of desire. Yet which of the two kinds of break ultimately prevails is crucial, for it determines whether the revolution will go bad and erect a new and equally even more repressive power structure, as happens since the degree of development of force is only increased in this process or on the contrary, will finally succeed in raising molecular desiring production to predominance over herd instinct and molar gregarity, realizing the future. Powerful shit as far as I'm concerned, and I think a good way of explaining this. As they're talking about these elements, it is important to remember we are talking about the production of everything. So what are the machinery parts that sit in line? We don't just have partial objects and then revolution. We don't just have partial objects in Ben Shapiro. We have a lot of shit that kind of sits in line between all of those partial objects and that. And you as an organism have a lot of shit between that too. Uh, your desire and the, the force with which it's able to invest and the, the amount of power, it's fuck, it's sexy. It's as I talked earlier, the connective, it is sexual. Sex is fucking everywhere. It isn't just people having sex. It's the bureaucrat with his fingers running lightly over everything. It's the, the pianist whose fingers stroke the keys. It is uh, everywhere. Sex is everywhere. The, the ability to invest into things and have your desire into things and the intensity and depth and as Jack was going to, the, the weight, heavy things. Oh, it's good. Desire's ready to invest in that. So you have your unconscious and desire. Pre-conscious, though, is uh, how you fall back on yourself. It's how your body without organs falls back on and how you lay things out and how you define the meaning and the grooves that meaning are able to take advantage of. Because, again, desire doesn't know it, your ass from a hole in the ground, um, has no clue what any of these things are. It just knows intensities. But you exist in a social space and inside of a socius. And the socius and all these things with these large representations through the methods they talked about up to this point, and I would argue significantly more in not just logic of sense and ATP, but in a lot of Deleuze's works. The way representation at a social level works is it creates and conditions where meaning can happen. The order of things that are allowed, uh, and you don't know that that's happening, and suddenly as your desire is flowing outwards, you are giving it excuses or reasons that it's going towards X, Y, or Z. Uh, it's why, uh, to take their example of the revolutionary energy that's co-opted, pick a regime in the history of the world, or even just go and talk to a libertarian who extens uh, ostensibly claims to be all for this fairly communist utopia of no state and power. And then suddenly they make the little twist that they've, they've invested things differently. They, they understand it. They have a very particular semblance of meaning that is allowed to happen inside of the social. And that process falls back on the investment that actual desire has the unconscious. It gives goals. It gives conditions to it. It, gives an investment that is political and historical and is related to the things inside of this. And suddenly you have this second reality that justifies kind of whatever. 
Um, it's why you can have people who genuinely are going for things that are by, by any study of history or anything, people are fighting for literal oppression and they will say they're fighting for freedom because their desires are being able to be met by the investment in that. And it just so happens that the way our society is organized, this is what freedom looks like. So they're able to be invested in freedom on a pre-conscious level and make that rationality as they go. The same could be very easily said of um, the Russian revolution or um, a handful of leftist revolutions that went horrifyingly wrong. Uh, it happens with everything. Um, and they're not saying that, oh, well, the right wing is people tricking. Oh, yeah, we tricked them. We got them over. That's the lib it's not a matter of ideological trickery or bullshitting. These people are produced, just like all of us are. Their desires have a place to go and a place to invest. And lo and behold, it happens to fit with the story society allows all of us to tell. It's how you end up getting leftists on our side, supposedly, who I genuinely believe, um, rationally believe whatever they do um, and think about it, but end up in a place where they talk about how China's pure communist and how Russia should be defended at all costs. And they, they say other things that are right and it's confusing and you feel a good energy for them, but it doesn't work out. It's, it's tough. This is very difficult or, or even worse, you end up with a hyper revolutionary group who's ready to completely change everything and uh, does it through selling t-shirts in third world sweatshops, makes excuses for why, and we have to do it. We don't have a choice. And uh, the revolutionary energy uh, co-opted because meaning is only allowed to be generated in a certain way within our society. This element is the thing that they're pushing at. The uh, line, um, those who have an interest in this sense are always of a smaller number than those whose interest in some fashion is had or represented. The class from the standpoint of praxis is infinitely less numerous or less extensive than the class taken in its theoretical determination. The actual people who are ready to allow their desire to be completely break free and are able to spend time to break down a general set of meetings and have a proper investment or uh, uh, way of handling the social that's different is uh, incredibly small, if, if existent at all. Very difficult for us in the left. It's a very tough part for us, to say the least. Sorry for the ramble. Uh, I love this paragraph a great deal. This is why I, I, whenever I'm on streams, I often make the joke that uh, it's okay, everyone's reactionary, because I believe that. Um, cause this, this, I've, there's a lot of secondary writing on this and this form of thought, they continue a great deal, but it's difficult to defeat the fascist within, which is what this enables, especially socially, uh, questions, comments, please. Anything. Um, sorry for the ramble. I'll give it a second for someone else to talk because it was a lot. Yeah, I mean, going back, I, I think it's really important to keep in mind what we mean by molar, right? So it's just hopping back to 342. What are the major traits of a molar formation or a form of gregariousness, the herd instinct? And obviously that's important because we just talked about how that kind of molar assemblage is going to be really critical for understanding the modulation of the socius, right? So they write, they, molar formations, effect a unification, a totalization of the molecular forces through a statistical accumulation, obeying the laws of large numbers. This uni unity can be the biological unity of a species or the structural unity of a socius. An organism, social or living, is composed as a whole as a global or complete object. So I'll put away the rest of that, but the reason I bring this up is because when we're talking about trying to distinguish these, these investments and where they're moving, right, 
because this is a question of how things are moving as much as how things are put together. We're looking at things that were, that, that appeal to a unity, appeal to a totality, and in this case, a totality of the molecular, uh, and do so through stats, right? So the way things end up aggregating, the way things, I hate to say it this way, but in a sense, the way things come together, but come together through large numbers, right? Men always go this way, for instance. So if you if you move that into where they're talking about here now, right, how do we understand the pre-conscious versus the, uh, the unconscious here? They make this point early on that mass phenomena, um, I believe they call it a paranoiac investment. But part of the point there is like mass phenomena seem, and this really does challenge us in a lot of basic assumptions, seeing yourself and more so the group in this kind of unity and totality is kind of what they're talking about because what that does is it is it sort of um, I don't want to say debuffs production but in a sense that's what it does right it's going to sort of regiment uh, molecular uh, assemblies right this is kind of their point about the totalizing part and what that does is it pressurizes that production right but it also this I think starts to lead into how things get selected, right? That thing that's going to represent the molecular through this kind of molar pressure is going to come into view, right? So you'll have the phallus linked, because it's always the phallus, right? You'll have the phallus linked um, to class, right? Yes. I mean, it's the, the interesting part of their play here is to kind of do away with um, a very traditional leftist presumption is that the proletariat is the source for the power of the working class. And why is it that the, why is it always that the working class supports these awful people? Well, it's because they've been tricked. Uh, I know the, the left in the U S has made that comment a lot and talks about how, Oh, these people, if they just don't understand they're voting against their own self-interest, if only I could enlighten them. And um, that's not unique to America. Like welcome to welcome to it. Uh, their response is basically, yeah, that's because that's not really where it starts. Like there's more, that, that's sort of made and that sort of idea that someone is the working class, the upper class, the white collar, blue collar, all of these class determinations um, are sort of secondary rationalizations for why we invest uh, a primary unconscious of into power and to intensities and that we sort of rationalize after the fact with these elements. Right. And we can push this further is where they write, excuse me. So after they start talking about how you get the vacuoles of lack, right? They go on to say, a class is defined by a regime of syntheses, a state of global connections. So first synthesis, exclusive disjunctions, second synthesis, and residual conjunctions, third synthesis, that characterize the aggregate being considered. So what this starts to mean then is the unity at large that helps, uh, that, that allows objects to be considered uh, complete onto themselves, right? Uh, and more so, I think that starts to get into these points that we've been talking about, where you have the either or, right? the law, usually the law of the father and the con, right? And you start getting into this then. What class, I think, comes into view as then is it does come into view as something molar and therefore unconscious. But what's interesting about that then is that one and the same time, right? Because you still have the socius at play in all of that, right? That modulation of class then having been conditioned by the Stoicius. When they talk about the pre-conscious, what's interesting there is, it's almost like they're saying, right, we're focusing on the way things aggregate, the way things unify, and the way things can basically be put to a stop, 
because I think that's part of what the totality gives you is, you know, we talked about addition, the, the summation terminates, right? And that kind of unity, I think, is interesting because it sounds to me like what they're getting at then is that's still part of the unconscious, but that pertains to the pre-conscious, which means that 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 gregariousness is basically going to be appear it's going to be what comes into view of consciousness. So like I always give the example of um, you know, this, this is I, I feel bad for Richard Wolf because I hate to hate to criticize him, but I always give the example of worker co-ops because you're trying to change the formation of the organization through something like an appeal to democracy, right? And this is kind of their point, I think, is that you're only changing the way things end up, well, the way things, the conditions for the way things end up. You're not really changing, um, this, you're not really allowing the pressure to be released. You're just kind of reorganizing you're, that you're pressure. Not, you're not changing the allowed space for options. Like if, if we talk about an actual, like when you talk about, oh, we, we add worker co-ops and then capitalism will be great, which is, I do love uh, dogmatic Marxist economists like that. Um, and I used to like Richard Wolff a lot. Um, the, the problem is that um, because desire is investing in power and intensities and uh, weight and all of these things, the rationalization we then ex post facto give for the choices that are ultimately made for us that we then claim as our own can be fucking anything. So that realm is the important thing. What am I allowed to say are my choices? What are the, what are the, the opportunities I have for saying why these 12 singularities in a row are given meaning or what they mean? Uh, that possibility space is incredibly tiny inside of capital, inside of most soci, to be frank, but within capital, it's incredibly small. Um, think of the reasons you do a thing, or just think of anything that you've ever done, and talk about in that moment, in out of context of the rest of society, why you did that thing, the 900 ways you could describe it, the reasons, the justifications, the what happened. Uh, if you want to go back to like logic of sense, you can even start playing with things uh, in terms of uh, his joke around uh, a scalpel doesn't actually cut anyone. The skin is cut and a scalpel is there. Inside of any moment, yeah, there, we, the way meaning works is really fucked up. So if you have a very tiny space of what's allowed to be said as those reasons, and on top of it, you have a very particular intensity of investment in a very certain direction, it doesn't matter how you organize society. Like, have all the co-ops you fucking want in the world, as long as capital is ultimately at the end of that, as long as we have these other things, here is how this is going to continue to work because it creates the possibility space for how you're allowed to justify it. And while you may at some point have some level of uh, revolutionary interest, sure, that's great at the unconscious level, unless you also have it in the investment socially, unless you also have it at the pre-conscious level, it doesn't matter. You can have pre-conscious investment that is completely revolutionary. You can have all kinds of fun leftist podcasts that are ultimately in the service of capital and that people are able to sort of get behind. And that's great, cool. But at the same time, underneath it, what are they really invested in? Where, where is the actual libidinal desire focused? It's not in the ideas. Desire doesn't know ideas. It's still in that imminent weighted capital and the way capital organizes intensities and plays with them. So until we do something to fix how those elements are able to be done to break away, and this is more my opinion, but to start breaking away what, uh, uh, what meaning is allowed and open up that possibility space, you end up with people justifying things by whatever reason or double speak or hypocritical thing, because none of that matters, and their interests are ultimately in line with the rest of society because that's where the intensities are. Yeah. Did that help I mean, all, Drew? Just real quick, Drew, is this helping at all? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm also trying to write down notes as I go because I'm, I'm trying to connect um, 
this more broadly to my own personal like concrete uh you know projects but yeah on an abstract level this really helps and it also um because i'm also coming from the american context it it definitely helps um put all the um social media discourse into um more clear perspective <laughs> because there's well, it, no end to that sure. the the ukraine thing is actually an amazing sort of example of this and i've used it a couple times and i'm slowly formulating it to be very explicit but do you you have people who i think in general have some level of revolutionary spirit or investment and their pre-conscious investments the things that they believe are goals are so particularized that it doesn't matter the like underlying way that reality is playing out it doesn't matter because it ultimately people on the left are backing russia and they're backing russia fucking hard however you do it the the reasons you're doing that is because you have these very particular pre-conscious investments that your social circles and your very specific things are set up the the play um, that they have here is they say the other class can constitute itself only by a counter investment that creates its own interest in terms of new social aims, new organs and means, and a new possibility of social syntheses. That's great. Once the necessity for this other class to be represented by a party apparatus that assigns these aims and means and affects the revolutionary break and the pre-conscious, the linen and break, for example, in this domain of pre-conscious investments or of class or interest, it is therefore easy to distinguish what is reactionary or formist and what is revolutionary. But those who have an interest in this sense are always of a smaller number than those whose interest in some fashion is had or represented. The class, from the standpoint of praxis, is infinitely less numerous or less extensive than the class taken in its theoretical determination. This is where you start playing with how desire is invested versus these pre-conscious and the sort of weird fucked up place especially in america we're at i have a friend who like is upset that sweden's joining nato just as a, as an example and like i get it i i i get it but it's it's a confusing thing at the same time because that's he's definitely a leftist and he's deeply caring but why and how and what are these things well it's he is falling back on the pre-conscious investments that have been laid out in the order he's allowed by the social situation and his actual unconscious desire is attaching to the things that it wants to based on intensity and uh, uh, weight and uh, yeah, power. And those, those things all in all ultimately produce what he claims is his belief or his understanding of things. Yeah, I'm especially thinking about how uh, it seems a lot of people are still connecting in America. I should very be very specific about this. In America, a lot of people who uh, identify, like call themselves leftists, are um, claiming Russia in this, in this you know, social media debate. Um, and it seems they're still connecting um, Russia with their memory of Soviet Russia from childhood, perhaps. And they're drawing their allegiance or their perspective from that context. Um, I know or, that that's the case outside of the U.S. <laughs> or, or Russia, as it existed for a long time and and did for some time, the the counter investment, the power in the molar of being attracted to a generalized intensity that Russia formed, which it did, and existed especially in the American zeitgeist, is exceptional so when you're talking about intensities and power and all of these things that start allowing that the desire like goes fuck i want that uh like just give me give me power and attach to it these things had power uh and they had an attraction and i very much understand it so is it an unconscious desire for this sort of weird subjugation that they've got with russia and that maybe they they have also this other side that is uh, you know, pre-consciously invested in the old stories that they believe are still common. That these, this is a complex thing. This is, uh, this is one of the things that I really am attracted to. And this is again, I I do believe most people, all people, are incredibly multidimensional and complicated and annoying in that sense. It isn't like, oh no, everyone would be just like me if only they understood my world. And it's like, that's not that doesn't hit me in the right way. Instead, to me, it's 
this. It's we can start having conversations around where is investment of your desires actually hitting at that base unconscious level, thinking through how these things are feeling powerful and, and attractive in that sense. And then at the same time, how representations are playing and how your pre-conscious is formed and where you believe you as a class or what class you believe you fit in, which is also the other side of what you're talking about, the the pre-conscious investment in the class of the American left that um, you very much, I've seen, go off a fucking cliff over the last year, which has been insane. But they're traditionalists. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, in theory, was one of us at one point. If you can even, um, you kids can imagine. Um, the There's a lot of strangeness that sort of happens around this, but it's not just, oh, it's just ideology, which I think oversimplifies and actually removes a lot of the complexity of human experience from why people do what they do. Um, poor people aren't just tricked. They're not just dumb. There's a lot happening because rich people are also tricked. And so we're middle-class people and everyone. We do a lot of shit like that. So it's, it's why, what attracts me to it. But this, this paragraph for sure nails it. All right. Uh, I will move to the next paragraph unless anyone has a final question here or a final thought. Uh, just to try and close this up then yeah i mean i right it's not that they're tricked it's that they like with the pre-conscious it's the part of this totality this is kind of a bakhtinian way of saying it but it's the it's the part of the unity part of the, the molar um that is going to have the eye if it's to it right it's going to pass into consciousness and i think that's really important because you know, we're talking about how goals in that can even be possible. Uh, to push that further, then, like this is, I think, a very basic way of understanding what they're talking about with the criticism of the Leninist break, right? Uh, and you use the word subjugation, Brooks, and I think that's pretty spot on, right? What basically ends up happening then is you're rearranging the aggregate. Well, there's an investment that's producing people so as to rearrange the aggregates, right? What that basically amounts to then is that not only is it a simple way of saying you're changing the molar, but it basically means, right, the appeal to class or the appeal to uh, even putting it in terms of the smaller number, right? There's, I think, a subtle point here, which is that effectively what's happening then is even if gregariousness isn't just a question of amount of people, right? It's a question of appealing to what can be part of the uh, the, the totalizing, the the unification in that, right? The, the process of aggregation. And I think that's really important because, right, the part of the main thing with the, the Leninist break is that a minority does take power. But the larger point to losing water you're making is that in, that in and of itself is all for the sake of reorganizing the molecular, uh, the molar, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, a question of a different kind of subjugation in that sense. All right. Um, anything else before I move into the next paragraph? Because it's... Uh, going to continue the same train of thought, but we're about to get into a little bit more deep of uh, some of the things I was discussing and we were just discussing. So let me know. All right. This situation is not at all adequate, however, for resolving the following problem. Why do many of those who have or should have an objective revolutionary interest maintain a pre-conscious investment of a reactionary type? More rarely, how do certain people whose interest is objectionably, objectively reactionary come to affect a pre-conscious revolutionary investment? Must we invoke in the one case a thirst for justice, a just ideological position as well as a correct and just view, and in the other case a blindness, the result of an ideological deception or mystification? Revolutionaries often forget or do not like to recognize that one wants and makes revolution out of desire, not duty. Here as elsewhere, the concept of ideology is an execrable, 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 
I will need to learn how to pronounce that, execrable concept that hides the real problems, which are always of an organizational nature. If Reich, at the moment he raised the most profound of questions, why did the masses desire fascism? was content to answer by invoking the ideological, the subjective, the irrational, the negative, and the inhibited, it was because he remained the prisoner of derived concepts that made him fall short of the materialist psychiatry he dreamed of, that prevented him from seeing how desire was part of the infra infrastructure and that confined him in the duality of the objective and the subjective. Consequently, psychoanalysis was consigned to the analysis of the subjective as defined by ideology. But everything is objective or subjective as one wishes. That is not the distinction. The distinction to be made passes into the economic infrastructure itself and into its investments. Libidinal economy is no less objective than political economy, and the political no less subjective than the libidinal, even though the two correspond to two modes of different investments of the same reality as social reality. There is an unconscious liberal investment of desire that does not necessarily coincide with the pre-conscious investments of interest, and that explains how the latter can be perturbed and perverted in the most somber organization below all ideology. Um, chapter 3. And I mean the whole book, but chapter three, they went in very deep into how language works, especially the written word and how these things begin to change how we're able to talk about stuff, uh, how it, it, it mutates and mutilates uh, what desire is capable of as it moves, the formations it's able to take part in. Um, the phrasing here begins calling that back up, as did the previous paragraph. The question they ask is they start with, well, why, why did Reich answer so simply? And their answer is because he actually was a prisoner of these derived constructs that made him fall short, that confined him to this duality. This setup that he's confined to, to go back to my point I was making about how meaning is generated, how we talk about things, how, how we're able to rationalize or justify, it is ultimately placed inside of a gutter, and it can roll in one direction with some modification because of the structure of the semiotic language and it being a social thing, because of how signification works, because of how language sort of plays the role of a God's voice when we see it written, because of, and I can keep going on, they have a lot of this, you end up in a place where the allowance of what you're able to actually say and claim and the meaning you're able to generate is this tiny, tiny little rail that you have to stay right on instead of the mass revolutionary potential of possibility space. And this is what they're getting at with Reich here. He was stuck in this same place, this duality of the objective and the sub subjective. The, um, I think the line, consequently, psychoanalysis was consigned to analysis of the subjective as defined by ideology. This play of Reich, and there's a lot of books of Reich's followers since then very much go in this direction. They're really interesting to read. Um, and even uh, the big fuzzy bear Zizek goes this direction. But their play here is to move it differently. It's, it's not the distinction between objective and subjective. The, that's not it. The distinction to be made passes into the economic infrastructure itself and into its investments. Libidinal economy is no less objective than political economy, and the political no less subjective than the libidinal, even though the two correspond to two modes of different investments of the same reality as social reality. There is an unconscious libidinal investment of desire that does not necessarily coincide with the preconscious investments of interest, and that explains how those Pre-conscious investments of interest can be perturbed and perverted in the most somber organization below all ideology. Again, the process of meaning generation and how we justify. Please, I, I leave it open, anyone. I'm, I'm thinking about less in terms of justification, although that certainly follows. Um, I'm thinking about it in terms of 
So like, how do you get an investment, right? A very simple place to start. Their point is that what desire does is par is either investing or invested in, and usually you have, you know, you have both of those things going on, right? Just like with associates being conditioned by, um, by the molar uh, grouping, so too is that going to be conditioned by the socius and what it's going to do, right? Mm -hmm. And then from there you're going to start getting the preconscious. So it's interesting then because of that level. It's exactly what they're saying, just like with psychoanalysis and, and that those do relate to investments, right? And when when the syntheses are used, whether paralogistically or syllogistically, there is an uh, there are investments made, right? Part of the 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 weight of this argument that they're making is, you know, Lenin's revolution does succeed. Taking that, take it, you know. Barring all the other criticisms, um, there is a major shift that happens. There is a major change, right? At one and the same time, what makes it reactionary, um, and, you know, granting that success of at least affecting a, you know, a change in government and all that at a complete reorganization. What makes it, I think, reactionary then is that basically the investments playing into the reconstruction of that government um, and of that class, and of, you know, the, the more uh, aspect of the people there, right? Those investments don't allow for any release. Instead, what you get is a, a different set of pressurization. You get new totalities, new unities and that, but you're not getting any release of what was actually repressed. Well, and this gets into that other line, which I like um, in this one, which is uh, comparing the molar economy, uh, you know, the one we live in, we buy and sell stock, we do all kinds of things, buy and sell shit to have all that. They're, the idea of the economic infrastructure, libidinal economy is no less objective than political, political, no less subjective than libidinal. The political economy of all of this uh, favors how people relate, how people deal with each other at a social level is as objective and subjective as the libidinal. I really like that phrasing. I really like it. It's a, instead of thinking that there is this uh, invisible hand moving the market or determining what people say socially, we all kind of chuckle at that silliness, but we presume the same thing of the libidinal economy that you're able to move things around and, oh, I, oh, it's not my desire to move it uh, over there. Um, no, it's, there's a, there's a objectivity and subjectivity that puts it on par with political economy, which I, I just like that they do that comparison and, and get very explicit about it. Uh, it's, it's really critical there, right? Because it, it's that same problem of like, how are we going to critically engage the Russian revolution, right? Uh, because it's still a hall, and we were just talking about, it's still a hallmark of um, all sorts of social discussions, you know, and it continues to be, right? It continues to be very informative, right? And that's why it's, at some level, it connects to an index of um, these investments, right? Because I think, I think part of the point is that like, whatever is going to be justifiable is contingent on these molar reorganizations. And that's really, I think, part of where the Russian Revolution for them falls short in a lot of ways, right? Well, it's it's about finding, um, it's about having a conversation about pre-conscious and unconscious interests and being able to identify them and compare them. It's not that, oh, the, the working poor that rose up, the Bolsheviks, they took control, but but they were corrupted by a handful of leaders and they blah, blah, blah. And it's like, ah, really? Really? That's, we're going to go with that. Maybe it's uh, that they had the desire underneath it and they were able to push for it, but maybe their investments and pre-conscious investments went a different way. Or maybe both actually were in a different way and it just seemingly had the cover of such a thing. Um, 
there's a lot of different ways to break it down. And we're going to start getting into that, actually. Um, the next paragraph, which I think I want to get to, unless anyone has questions, uh, dives in to libidinal investment specifically, which I think is a great place for us to go next. Uh, but I'll leave it open, please. Any questions, thoughts, anything? Just, just following that point real quick, and somebody else can, can talk. I, th I think that's really critical, too, though, because... Again, you know, there is a shift that happens with the Russian Revolution, right? And it's it's taken as such, right? I'm appealing to something in its aggregate, perhaps even. And I think that's really fundamentally important here because the molar does change, right? Like you're saying, the, the, at some level, yeah, maybe the peasants do take power and all that. But just as critically, right, there's a reproduction of the molar. And it does, it is different in a lot of ways, right? And that's really important because it, because we're talking about the pre-conscious. That's going to be more, more immediately what appears to us, or rather it's going to inform what appears to us. And that's where I think a lot of difficulties, uh, but also the opportunities for schizoanalysis, right? Those are the kind of challenges it's taking on. The stuff starts to become lucid there, despite being challenging. All right. Anyone else? It's really a shot. I'm giving you a try. I edit the awkward silences before I upload it, so I don't mind being silent and really annoying you while you're here tends to pressure you into talking sometimes. That's funny because when I was doing the editing, I edited out all the talking, so there was only awkward silences. <laughs> oh, God. Ugh. Ah, fuck. You just said something very, very, very clever, too. That's a shame. You've taken yourself down multiple points today. You should have stayed where you were. Goddamn dad jokes. Hey. You know me, man. I'm always breaking through the walls. Fuck, if I don't, don't, oh, God. Okay. Um, let's move to the next paragraph. Uh, libidinal investment does not bear upon the regime of the social syntheses, but upon the degree of development of the forces or the energies on which these syntheses depend. It does not bear upon the selections, detachments, and remainders affected by these syntheses, but upon the nature of the codes and the flows that condition them. It does not bear upon the social means and ends, but upon the full body as socius, the formation of sovereignty or the form of power for itself, devoid of meaning and purpose, since the meanings and the purposes derive from it and not the contrary. It is doubtless true that interests predispose us to a given libidinal investment, but they are not identical with this investment. Moreover, the unconscious lib lib libidinal investment is what causes us. I'm going to reread that. Moreover, the unconscious libidinal investment is what causes us to look for our interest in one place rather than another, to fix our aims on a given path, convinced that this is where our chances lie, since love drives us on. The manifest syntheses are merely the preconscious indicators of a degree of development. The apparent interests or aims and aims are merely the preconscious exponents of a social full body. As Klesowski says in his profound commentary on Nietzsche, a form of power is identical with the violence it exerts by its very absurdity, but it can exert this violence only by assigning itself aims and meanings in which even the most enslaved elements participate. Quote, the sovereign formations will have no other purpose than that of making the absence of a purpose or a meaning of their sovereignty by means of the organic purpose of their creation, end quote. And the purpose of thereby converting the absurdity into spirituality. That is why it is so futile to attempt to distinguish what is rational and what is irrational in a society. To be sure, the role, the place, and the part one has in a society and from which one inherits in terms of the laws of social reproduction, impel the libido to invest a given socius as a full body, 
a given absurd power in which we participate or have the chance to participate under the cover of aims and interests. The fact remains that there exists a disinterested love of the social machine, of the form of power, and of the degree of development in and for themselves. Even in the person who has an interest and loves them besides with a form of love other than that of his interest, this is also the case for the person who has no interest and who substitutes the force of a strange love for this counter-investment. Flows that run on the porous full body of a socius, these are the object of desire higher than all the aims. They will never flow too much. They will never break or code enough. And in that very way, oh, how beautiful the machine is. The officer of in the penal colony demonstrates what an intense libidinal investment of a machine can be, a machine that is not only technical, but social, and through which desire desires its own repression. Uh, let's talk about two texts. Uh, we'll talk about it in the penal colony in a second. That's obviously one of them. But I want to talk about uh, the famous poem about the road less traveled. Uh, it's one of my favorite poems because everyone gets it wrong. But I think it is about, this paragraph's about it. It's Frost, yes. Uh, road less traveled, path less traveled, doesn't matter. The poem, we all know, especially if you're American. It's very embedded in American culture and commercials and all of that. Um, the story of a man who comes to two paths and uh, I took the road less traveled and it made all the difference, except that the poem opens literally describing them as being identical and that neither one had been traveled more or less than the other. Uh, the poem is actually making fun of people who post facto say that they had a great experience or justify things that they've done based on lies. That's what the poem's actually about. Frost wrote it about a friend of his who always made a big deal about things he had done that kind of, it didn't really matter. And it was ribbing him. It was meant to be a joke. We do this though. Like this is a very, very human thing. I'm not the only person who does this. And Frost certainly wasn't writing about nobody. The reality of things we do is we post facto justify actions or elements or things that have happened in our lives. If you watch tech bro culture, you'll see a lot of uh, hustle culture bullshit where it's, I worked 20 hours a day and I've slept outside and I, I drank nothing but caffeine and cocaine and that's why I was able to earn my first dollar by 40. And just silly bullshit. Now, it's, it's not that it's lies. I mean, probably it is. But it's more that it tells you a story you want to be told. And you want yourself to be a thing. And by doing so, you've kind of decided what it's going to be. You've kind of decided the path that you've taken and that it is the one that you want. The investment we have in these elements, the, the way that these work, the unconscious libidinal investment is what causes us to look for our interest in one place rather than another. To fix our aims on a given path, convinced this is where our chances lie since love drives it on. This line here is the big deal of this paragraph to me. Um, there's a lot of great stuff in here, but this is the line. The moment we actually have our investment, we look for our interest there. We fall back on. We set this up. The idea of falling back on and saying, oh, I chose that path because it's pretty. Uh, really? Maybe it was because it, had a whole bunch of different force elements that sort of were related to why the molecular did it. Because ultimately, love is, you go that way. That's great. But you sort of have it define why you did it. We look for our interest there. We define our interest based on where we look. That back and forth, again, because our interests are ultimately shaped by force that is kind of generated socially, capital in our case, but the socius, at large, is creating these effects and ultimately creating the space with which we're able to look for our investment. Sure, I want to go that way, but I have to justify it very particular ways. And that's, uh, that's the fun side of things. 
a great piece. I really love this. Um, Drew says this may derail it, but I think this section specifically calls out Reich's orgone accumulation as a way of moving away from material psychiatry. If not, I'm getting something extra. No, your your toyer's fine. That's I, I don't think it's it's direct. I think they mention it one more time, but it's throughout this. They're they're trying to make a play a lot more to Bataille and debt uh, as a thing. And um, the use of debt there, we'll get to it. We're going to get to it. Um, but for sure, that's their line, I think, here about spirituality. I think you're right. It's, it's very much in that direction. I think pointedly so. Um, Jack, any thoughts before I get to uh, the second text that they meant, the first text that they mentioned here in, in the penal colony? The great Kafka piece that is deeply about religion and how deeply you can believe a thing or feel or want a thing uh, libidinally. That might be my favorite Kafka piece. Otherwise, it's my second favorite. I, I really love the castle, uh, which oh, also goes through too. a lot of absurdity. <laughs> it's it's pretty. Those are my, those are my two. I, I in the penal colony, I think. Um, the trial's good too, but in the penal colony is mm. probably my favorite for sure. Uh, barring like the, he's got one parable I absolutely adore. Uh, it's the one about the king sending you sending you out uh, a messenger, and the messengers. You know, the, the going trial through all those good. people. <laughs> Kafka's great, uh, but before we get to in the penal colony, do you have anything on this paragraph? Yeah, I, a couple of quick observations. Um, as quick as they can be. So when they write, libido investment does not bear upon the regime of the social, social syntheses, but upon the degree of the development of the forces or the energies on which the syntheses depend. It does not bear upon the selections, detachments, and remainders affected by these syntheses, but upon the nature of the codes and the flows that condition them. So again, you know, how do we find investments? How do we, how do we locate them? And, you know, part of the the point here is that we're finding them with flows, codes, and territorialities, right? Which is at a very basic level. But they're starting out by saying, as we look for these investments, it's not that these bear upon the molar and molecular. So it's not that the investments are the uh, the condition of the molar, the molecular, so much as they condition the degree of development of the forces on which the syntheses depend. So the in, the intensity of the uh, of what we're talking about then is going to be what the investments condition more directly than the syntheses themselves. So it's a roundabout way, I think, of saying what the syntheses work with is what the investments condition and effectively intensify, as opposed to just conditioning the syntheses. Excellent. Um, for those who haven't read In the Penal Colony, um, like a lot of Kafka stories, uh, dude's walking around, comes to this uh, penal colony, and uh, witnesses an execution. It's not a normal execution. There's this wildly complicated machine that kills the condemned. Um, the idea of it, as they kind of talk about it, um, how to put it, uh, I'm, I'm trying not to like ruin it without, cause it's so worth reading. It's not a long one. I highly recommend you pick it up. It's a short read. Um, in short, there's this really, really complicated machine that ultimately, uh, as part of the death sentence, apparently a person gets to, uh, experience like a, a religious event. Uh, it's a, is that how you'd phrase it, Jack? Like it's a, they have a revelatory moment, uh, supposedly in it. Yeah, I know what you're, you're gesturing at because it's, it's like with a lot of Kafka, there's an ambiguity to it, but it's like a, it's like a kind of ecstasy. Yeah, it's it's intended to be like, um, like a a brush with enlightenment almost. Um, but it's kind of how it's described. Again, it's not direct, but it's it's. This idea, and the guy who made it uh, hasn't been around for a while. Um, uh, the the new guy 
uh, is super in love with the the guy who made it. He's kind of retired and gone. The new guy who's in charge of it super, super loves this thing and is all over the idea of it. He, he, he really wants it back and he thinks it's the best thing ever. And it used to bring a million people to see it, all this stuff. And so he's like super behind it. And so ultimately, uh, they kind of get, uh, they try to go and get this machine brought back as a, as a murder weapon and an execution weapon. Um, and they finally have a condemned person, but the officer, in order to prove this machine, frees the guy and I believe has carved into himself or wrote on himself the words justice. Oh, fuck. I need to reread this more recently. Um, and I puts himself in correct. it. And it, he, he puts himself in it. And uh, turns out the machine ain't, it ain't working very well anymore. And um, he doesn't get the experience. He doesn't get the religious moment. Um, instead, he just gets fucking stabbed to death by the machine brutally in front of everyone. Um, and I, there's this really interesting sort of ending to the entire thing. Um, the, the idea for the com the guy who died was that he will rise again from the dead and his followers will bring him back. And, um, at that point, uh, the, the traveler like leaves. He's like, ah, this is a, yeah, it's a bit much. I don't, I don't think so. And so it's this really, oh wait, no, it was a previous commandant who's going to rise again and, and have his religious followers. It, it, the entire thing is intentionally a play on the idea of people sacrificing themselves generally for uh, for religiosity. The idea of, uh, I mean, he might have made it sort of in line with someone who's like a suicide bomber or people who are religious zealots. But the machine is a thing that these people are attached to, and they this guy loves it so much he puts himself in it. Ultimately, it doesn't work. Gets stabbed to death. Doesn't get the religious crazy moment that he was praying for, and that sort of turn on things is. I think very much where Kafka was sort of forcing this. It was, it was intended to mock sort of generalized religion and how we sacrifice ourselves for it. There's a lot of meaning in it. That's a very short version. Jack, anything to add? Yeah. Um, if you go all the way back to 1.3, see, I, I'm, I'm terrible today. I'm just doing a bunch of flashbacks. Um, mm -hmm go all the way back to 1.3 when they're talking about the celibate machine. One of the examples they give is the machine from the story we're talking about. And I think that's really critical here because what they're going through in these few, well, particularly in this, these last two paragraphs, right? They're going through how the syntheses um, work with investments. And just like we're talking about with the Kafka story, right? Uh, we've passed into how the production of subjectivity, right? The third synthesis, the conjunct, consummation, and the conjunction. We're talking about how that's bound up in this part process. It's worth keeping that in mind as we're discussing the Kafka stories. Deleuze and Guattari look to that as an example of the machine that, um, you know, that that does the effectivity for subjectivity. I made a rhyme. Mm hmm. Really good book. Please go read it. I suggest it uh, always. It's not very long at all. I think it's actually not even a book. I think it's a very short story. Is it a book? It's not a book. It's a fucking tiny thing. Yeah, you got it. It's like, I think it's like 23 pages. It's like nothing. Yeah. It's a, I think it's in one of my compilations I have. I don't think it gets its own dedicated book. There we go, in the penal colony. Thank you, Drew. Drew links to it. Um, I hope I got even half of my, my, my summary correct. It has been, uh, I think the last time I read it was when it was mentioned the first time in our first reading. It was the last time I've read it, so it's been a bit. But the, uh, the point of bringing it up, to talk about how it sort of comes back in here, um, to just restate the ending of this paragraph. The fact remains that there exists a disinterested love of the social machine, of the form of power, and of the degree of development in and for themselves. Even in the person who has an interest, and 
loves them besides with a form of love other than that of his interest. This is also the case for the person who has no interest and who substitutes the force of a strange love for this counterinvestment flows that run on the porous full body of a socius. These are the object of desire higher than all the aims. Again, not goals, desire. It will never flow too much. It will never break or code enough. And in that very way, how beautiful it is. The officer of in the penal colony demonstrates what an intense libidinal investment of a machine can be, a machine that is not only technical but social and through which desire desires its own repression. So penal colony machine is uh, society. We live in a penal calling machine is the new Joker meme, I guess. It's not far from actually what they're saying. It's a stupid way to put it though, Brooks. I will edit that out of this. That's a fun part about being an editor. Um, I got a question here. Um, please. Yeah, the, uh, so he's talking about, you know, these uh, social machines that all these institutions that, um, that derive from this um, the kind of the uh, Nietzsche's aesthetic ideal right uh, that the uh, that we you know uh, people sacrifice themselves to these um, forms of these different forms of the aesthetic I ideal which are, are machines a social machine the molar like all these are part of that same machine and you know it's kind of uh, complicated to follow his his different descriptions of how these different machines operate and you know connect with one another but basically he's a it's a kind of a Structuralist description, isn't it? That's it's, that's it's, not it's, a bad way to put it. It's it, it is very much the ascetic ideal from Nietzsche. A lot of these machines and how they sort of come to be. I mean, genealogy of morality um, is a, there's a reason we did a reading of it both times we've read the book, and the reason they reference it a great deal. Spot on. Please continue, J.K. Right. So so he's he's really uh, describing as a a structure, right? Of um, of these different types of machines that work together, and that are are um, uh, biological desire machines, you know, uh, uh, coordinate with these these social machines, right? And that's what he means by what uh, uh, interests, investments of in, of uh, pre uh, pre conscious interests and um, and uh, unconscious uh, investments. Well, it's 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 the idea of if these are let's say ascetic ideals, these machines, which I think works quite nicely. It's about um, the it's about repression. That's literally what ascetic ideals are. It's uh, the way slavery is formed over time, the way that uh, the will to power is sort of you know destroyed or fucked up, or we get into the space of self denying and destroying ourselves. And I think it the way that they're setting up here is they're talking through. Um, if, if desiring machines ultimately produce at the base level, everything, they are what make up everything. There's emergent elements that sort of come out of that. It's not so much that they desire any element. It's, they don't have an idea. They don't exist socially. Desiring machines don't. Language does. So do larger social formations and machines. So as the sort of emergent nature of a shit ton of desire machines come to be a person and a shit ton of people come together in order to be a social, the social machines that emergently move out of them in turn condition the production of desire and how they move. And the ascetic ideal, I think very much Deleuze is playing through here. The idea of these representations, not just um, flat blocking desire. I think he would probably make a move where it's, less about blocking desire, but instead being a, uh, a a place that conditions it and plays with it in that direction rather than, you know, just doing away with uh, the will itself. But yeah, it's very much in that direction, I think. If anyone else has a thought, I, I'm not as super read on Nietzsche. This is one of the few that I can say I am fairly read on, but uh, in general, I'm less read on Nietzsche than most. Yeah, this, uh, uh, you know, Kafka's uh, penal colony really, uh, you know, um, yeah, helped, uh, you know, help me understand what he's, what he's talking about. It's, this notion of these uh, social machines and how we sacrifice, you know, that, that kind of like covers the, 
a whole history of um, you know religious um, institutionalized uh, religion and so forth, right? The, the sacrifices being made for these various kinds of um, social machines. So thanks for explaining. Sharing that. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think it helps to look at how. I mean, they're they're doing it through Klazowski, so it's really Klazowski's engagement with Nietzsche that they're engaging. But I think it helps to look at that paragraph, or rather that passage. So they write, yeah, so much of this material is good, but they write, uh, the manifest syntheses are merely the preconscious indicators of a degree of development. The apparent interests and aims are merely the preconscious etspons of a social full body. So basically, right, what appears as interests and aims are like a second power of the preconscious affecting the social full body. So, you know, we talked about how that helps condition the, um, the what the socius is going to do, right? They go on to say, as Klazowski says in his profound commentary on Nietzsche, a form of power is identical with the violence it exerts by its very absurdity. But it can exert this violence only by assigning itself aims and meanings in which even the most enslaved elements participate. Before I read the quote, so it sounds like what they're saying to me then is the form of power being used here is identical with the violence it exerts. So the power is identical with the violence deployed by its very absurdity. So that's your common thread. But to do that, despite the absurdity, aims and meanings need to be produced, right? So Klazowski goes on to say, the sovereign formations will have no other purpose than that of masking the absence of a purpose or a meaning of their sovereignty by means of the organic purpose of their creation, end quote, and the purpose of thereby converting the absurdity into spirituality. So part of what I'm taking from this, and I'll turn over to somebody else, it's, it's a really interesting point they're making, right? There's no purpose for the sovereign formations. There's no purpose for the molar, the molar um, uh, assemblages, as I'm calling them. There's no purpose for them except masking the lack. I, I, I would say I would I would say not lack, masking the absence of a purpose or a meaning. Right, and that's where that's, the lack that's different than to... lack. But it's different than lack. Mm -hmm. Lack is lack is produced slightly differently. This is the I I think the play that and the line Klasowski is making here, and I think the play that D and G are making is that. Um, the the sovereign formations actually have no purpose they don't produce anything they they don't do shit they exist specifically to mask that they don't do shit and in that moment because they don't do shit and we've somehow found a way to justify their existence because of the generalized power structure and how capital forces us to generate our meaning we are then able in our investment um, uh, cause at this point we're talking about pre-conscious investment. Our investment is then able to justify their power or our attachment to their power. Um, to say another way, um, when someone says Elon Musk, uh, is the king of the world they or, or does everything for everyone or is the changing the world or all this shit, whatever it may be, their desire is generally towards levels of intensity but their investment, very particular in this way, is towards these formations that exist for the, ap the, the masking of their own absence of meaning. And so they convert this absurdity into a spirituality, the religious fervor that you might see of someone who is an avid Musk fan. We laugh about it because it's culty, there's a lot of shit that's culty. Neil deGrasse Tyson has this for Christ's sake. Like it's insane. The people that we do this to, but the setup is because they exist to prove that, uh, they, 
they have a purpose when they don't and to hide it. And that, that hiding is what enables us to have that spiritual moment, that secondary thing. I think your play towards the celibate machine makes sense here. That's why I, that's why I'm saying what I'm saying, because if it is towards a celibate, which is a, uh, the glorious, uh, organism or a play towards the, um, the machines that are completely disconnected from uh, lived experience. This would be towards that, the spirituality, the religious fervor, these things that um, are absolutely not connected to general production, but now live in a space of meaning that pretends like it defi it builds its own meaning. Um, let's start putting it together there. Because with the lack, we start passing into law. Right, we start passing the disjunction and more critically, we start passing into the lack being part of what informs the either or, right? The binding of equalization, the double bind. Because from there, we start to arrive at what, exactly where you're focusing on the conjunct, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's going to play into, I mean, in some sense, it's meaning, right? But that's going to play into, so that's, instead of, so that's what it was, it was, correct me if I'm wrong. So that's what you wanted all along, I think, is the move there. Well, you can't quite so, remember the so, phrase. So if it's, you know what, it could be So let's, let's jump there for a second, because um, I'm just going to chase what you said a little bit. That would mean that we're talking about, um, because lack is produced there, we're talking about a debt to these sovereigns. Hmm. Well, capital is moving, right? So what the socius is going to do disjunctively is itself a movement yeah. of capital, so, right? The social obligation is created through lack. Lack becomes deposited, distributed, and vacualized in the real. And that setup is enforced by anti-production. This whole thing is about debt. Yeah, I think debt's definitely here. I think, too, we got to keep in mind that, like, they're going to focus on, I mean, at some level, right, enslaved elements, but they're focusing on basically like the perpetual creation of a purpose becomes the mask of purposelessness, right? Yes. And that's the, really critical. The, this is the, the pre-conscious investment. The pre-conscious investment being into a mask because ultimately there's nothing that's actually produced inside of the space of representation, so they're not able to actually be invested in much. But that's their sort of rationale that is uh, ex post facto created. Whereas generally speaking, the intensities that these syntheses ultimately rely on produce incredible power that ultimately desiring machines are very attracted to. And uh, that sort of uh, unconscious desire and investment begins. And this helps us explain more of what's going on too, right? Because with this point, we're starting to see how groupings are, I think, taking place, how they're shaping vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the investments with the syntheses. Yeah, okay. Okay. Because part of what it does too is, right, I mean, since we're talking about Kafka, as absurd as that, as absurd as a lot of the penal colony is, I mean, the, the actual blueprint that's shown is indecipherable except for one person, right? And one, you know, as a reader, you find yourself in a position of main character being very skeptical as, as to if he understands it, and yet he can do the, the whole process. So maybe he does. You can't really know. But at this point, so, I think it's really interesting because the, as much as there's that absurdity with the law, there's also that spirituality, right? Go well, no, that, that's the thing, because ultimately lack is about depriving subjects of their objects of desire. But really what we're talking about is their objective being being deprived from them. Uh, desiring machines not being allowed to just be what they are. Instead, they have to become something, and the preconscious uh, being invested in these elements that sort of makes those demands and tells that story and creates those elements, this is where lack is ultimately sort of produced, uh, and debt within this debt too, in this case, I think actually the sovereign in this specific, uh, phrasing as they have it here, but I think in general, uh, we're talking about sort of a, 
a generation of debt because lived experience is no longer the thing that is being looked at. Instead, it is being used as the power behind the investment that is being made inside of the mask. And so as the power moves to the investment, you're now disconnected significantly from the actual lived being that is the organism. And that process is a massive amount of lack and debt that is created. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, it starts to help us under understand too why aims and interests, right? Well, oh, because those are representational. At, I mean, at some I mean, level, sure. What are you asking, I guess? It helps us see how they fit into that boat too, right? Explain. Well, you know, what do they do? Why are they why are they happening here as opposed to not happening? So they write to be sure of the role, the place, and the part one has in the society and from which one inherits in terms of the laws of social reproduction, impel the libido to invest a given socius as a full body, a given absurd power in which we participate, or have the chance to participate under the cover of aims and interests. The fact remains that there exists a disinterested love of the social machine, of the form of power, and of the degree of development in and of themselves. Even the person has an even in the person who has an interest and loves them besides with a form of love other than that of his interest. So part of the point I, I think we're getting at here is like the kind of meaning derived from codes and territorialities, right? Part of why that goes into code or part of why that goes into class is to basically keep keep the sovereignty in a position of reproduction. Hmm. Yeah, I, I can get with that. I think, I think there's another angle to it though, that goes with that because the aims and goals, again, the aims, goals, uh, interest, whatever that are happening at pre-conscious level are ex post facto manufactured and they're manufactured based on, for lack of better terms, the, uh, bodies and ideas and the mixtures of these things that ultimately I sitting at the surface of, you know, looking in the, in the heights and the, and the depths, I create the story in the mixture and I thread the way that I want these stories to go. And by doing so and being sort of set up where I have this sovereign, uh, element that is, uh, sort of a thing I'm capable of investing in, I'm able to justify that a billion different ways. Now, on the one side, it needs to be justified from a purely desire-focused direction. There has to be a level of, uh, we'll say, imminent uh, uh, power that desire itself is able to become invested in properly. Uh, uh, massive amounts of it, whatever you want to call it, but it's, it has to be there. Uh, namelessly, not as representation, just power. Secondarily, I need whatever I'm investing in to also be in line with generally the way I want to view not only myself, but also socially and how other people see me and also blah, 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 all the spaces of representation. Take the DGQC. Super easy for me to, on the one hand, say, oh, actually, I created this entire thing. I set this up myself. I am a very special, amazing human being uh, who has been doing this week on week on week and no one else has the power to do this. <laughs> I am very good. I could also tell a side story where uh, this started because of Craig uh, who does Acid Horizon and I, I just happened to be there and I was toadying up to him in order to build the entire thing. Uh, and we set it up and he ended up leaving and so I've kind of been just chasing it ever since. I could say that uh, I accidentally started doing this and I've just kept doing it because I really like it and it's fun every week. These are literally the same reality, but the story I'm weaving that justifies myself and then therefore the people around on is what I fall back on. But I don't do go through the process of selection with these things. Instead, the selection is conditioned by the realities of my social and my interests and also the desire behind it. I can tell you, my desire is big in the DGQC. I fucking love this place. It's great. Like I'm, ugh, feel it. 
but what am I actually invested in? And that tells the story of why my desire is attached to what it is. And then that then is conditioned further by all of the social elements around me. Just, just mentioning Craig, oh, can I even talk about him after he left? Because it, I don't know, do we get along anymore? This bullshit that kind of seeps in and starts, oh, socially this and then that, especially within capital, because within capital, everything's death around the wrong step in the wrong corner. So there's a problem. So I get to sit and I get to justify. Now, when I have the sovereign sitting there, whatever it may be, this religious and spiritual experience is one that is empty. It is celibate, it is disconnected from quite a different set of things. Uh, but it is one that is able to sort of drive that exceptional amount of instantaneous lack and debt that is able to continue to sort of, through anti-production, push around and continue to mold all of that. Well, it will be tied to a unification. Right. Because I think it's instead of, I think it's instead of, so I think the syllogism is, so that's what it was. I think the paralogism is, so it's. Yes. And I think you really get that here, right? Yes, 100%. It's great. I want to reread uh, Drew posted, and it's fucking great, is the earlier, it is not a question of ideology. There is an unconscious libidinal investment of the social field that coexists, but does not necessarily coincide with the pre-conscious investments or with that of the pre-conscious investments ought to be. That is why when subjects, individuals, or groups act manifestly counter to their class interests, when they rally to the interests and ideals of a class that their own objective situation should lead them to combat, it is not enough to say, they were fooled, the masses have been fooled. It is not an ideological problem, a problem of failing to recognize or of being subject to an illusion. It is a problem of desire, and desire is part of the infrastructure. Preconscious investments are made, or should be made, according to the interests of the opposing classes, but... Unconscious investments are made according to positions of dire desire and uses of synthesis, very different from the interests of the subject, individual, or collective who desires. Love that. Very different from the interests of the subject, individual or collective, who desires. Fuck, it's good phrasing. And again, this is critical too because what happens then is if we're talking about the molar, right, and how it affects the molecular, then, and, and we bring back all these syntheses in and how meaning can be derived from, say, an exclusive disjunction. Part of what we're getting at then is what classes do to them is they provide that pre-conscious piece, right? But very interestingly so, because what happens then is the molecular potential where Deleuze and Guadri will locate uh, in part, the potential for the revolutionary right. In its subjugation, it appears to us as class. And that's really critical because when we start talking about like the, the subject group then. Yes. Well, it's subject group subjugated is going to be a whole thing that's coming up very, very fast here. Yeah, I, I won't get into the depth of it all, but when we start talking about subject groups having these potentials, right? Mm -hmm. When we start getting into class, we start wondering how the unification contributes to these kind of repressions, where those singularities uh, get repressed in this manner, and in doing so, pass into uh, into class or into interest and aims. Right? Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any? Last questions or notes, because we have just hit the two hour mark and uh, I want to get back to real life. And uh, we are definitely not jumping into the next paragraph because uh, uh, that is going to take us a while because we start getting into a lot of what we're talking about. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. But um, yeah, we'll start with this one last question. I just want to make sure. Hey, Drew, did this help? Oh, yeah, um, definitely. I'm, I'm still picking up a lot of bits, but like, yeah, um, I think I, I think I've got this uh, on a much more, um, you know, precise, as as precise as you can get with Deleuze and Guattari. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you.
Good. Um, I would add, if you have a, a little bit of uh, time, uh, if you can find a PDF of it, uh, Chaosophy, which is uh, Felix Guadari's sort of compendium of a lot of interviews, he has a one called The Balance Sheet of Desiring Machines. Uh, balance Sheet for Desiring Machines? I'll look it up. Uh, it is exceptional for this specifically. Uh, it really does help a lot to understand when they say it's everywhere, they do mean that, that there really isn't a space where there isn't desiring machines and how they sort of play and how they sort of go with each other. It's a great uh, sort of summary of that that really also helps, again, build this very interesting, almost programmatic view of how meaning is generated. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have I have Chaosophy. That's one of the things I picked up, but then one. didn't read. So yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll grab that section and take take a look at it. Um, oh, the only thing I wanted to add is uh, every time I I look every time I bring they bring up Orgone, um, I'm reminded of the the idea that there was in fact an Orgone accumulating machine that you sat in, and it was supposed to uh, increase your um, Elon Vital like as an energy field. Yes. Um, so, yeah, um, they talk whenever they bring up spirituality and machines and Reich at the same time. That's that's the that's the image I get is that instead of instead of, um, you know, looking at the socius there, uh, it seems like they're they're commenting on Reich as well as um, a few other people, you know, like, oh, it, it's not it's not. It's not capital. It's your orgone energy is out, and you need to accumulate more. Yes. It's um. And and their use of Reich and their their conversation um around all of it when they play with libido, and it is uh. It's it's a little bit um. Um, I I think ahead here. Uh, well, also behind. It's hard to say. Um. But as they talk about it, it's, yeah, I, I, they, they, they very much appreciate Reich. They very much are saddened that he was. I think they explicitly talk about it even that he was sort of drummed out of psychoanalysis in general for what he said and how he brought. I think they said vitality and life back to psychoanalysis, um, which I think is a really amazing thing for them to say, given that they are hypercritical. But it's really cool phrasing. Yeah, I, I like that too. Because uh, it seemed like they were saying, look, he brought vitality back. It just kind of the wrong kind of vitality, or perhaps not the vitality they were pointing at. Yeah, uh, Reich thought he had thus overcome the alternative between mechanism and vitalism, since these functions, mechanical and electrical, existed in matter in general, but were combined in a particular sequence within the living. And above all, he upheld the basic psychoanalytic truth, the supreme disavowal of which he was able to denounce in Freud the independence of sexuality with regard to reproduction, the subordination of progressive or regressive reproduction to sexuality as a cycle. They really did love him. His, it's good shit, too. Man. Yeah. Man, that's good stuff. He's good. It was a good connection, too. I wasn't even thinking about Reich when we went through that. Yeah, I'm. I'm. A, I don't know if I'll be the only one who can say this, but I've actually sat in an orgone accumulator at one point in my life. You win. <laughs> I, I don't. I. I haven't. Well, uh, sixty-one. Maybe you have, or or maybe Jack has. Orgone accumulators are not. I've. I've seen them. I have never done it I myself. I was born sure. in one. <laughs> uh, of course. I'm in one right now. There we Whoa. go. No, I'm just kidding. I, I'd have, it, it is it is that server. It's entirely possible in this <laughs> server, right? Uh, um, awesome. Well, thank you all for joining. Um, we'll continue next week um, with uh, specifically, actually, how this sort of builds and works within the capitalist machine, uh, which is a lot is continuing what I was talking about earlier, but it's um, really just put beautifully. I love the next few paragraphs. They're so, this whole section is so good. Love it. Uh, but thank you all for joining very much. I'm going to go ahead and close out the recording bot and we'll see what we can do.